turn to John 6, and we'll be there in just a moment, as uh, John read earlier. I hope you all have had a good week, as everybody's getting, still getting adjusted back to school. Uh, I got to make an early trip to school one day this week, uh, as my son gets adjusted back to his school, so that was fun to, to get up extra early, take him to do some homework. So, uh, But I'm glad to be able to, to come here this morning and worship uh, with you all, to, to worship our great God, our great King, as we're going to see today. Um, let me uh, go to the Lord in prayer as we begin this time together. Uh, let me pray for uh, Northside Christian Church here in town as we, as we go to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for uh, a time of singing, time to sing great truths about who you are, to reflect on the words um, uh, that we've sung. Lord, help our hearts to be engaged with you uh, this morning. Help us to think about uh, the fact that you are an everlasting God on whom we can lean uh, in this life. Help us to see you in your word as we study and hear your word this morning. Help us to see you clearly, the truth about who you are, to not be blinded to the truth as Satan wants us to be. But God, help us to, to see you and let our hearts be overwhelmed with love for you. God, we just acknowledge this morning that there is much in our lives, much in this world that distracts us from seeing you. And Lord, we want to confess that this morning. We want to confess the ways that our eyes have been taken off you this past week, the things that we've let um, put our focus on other things that distract us from the truth and the beauty of who you are, God. God, help us to not be drawn to lesser things, lesser thoughts, lesser goals, lesser ideas or actions. Lord, help us to be focused on the greatest thing that we can be focused on, and that is Jesus. Lord, we want to be all about you. I pray for Northside Christian this morning, and another local church here in Georgetown. God, that you would use them. We, we want to see you use local churches in, in this city and across the world. And we know that your plan is the local church to reach this world for the gospel. So we ask your blessing on uh, Pastor Nick there and on that congregation, that you would use them here in this city and beyond. Bless our time in your word, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in our world, uh, one group of people that seem to get a lot of attention and a lot of notice by different, by different groups are rulers and kings, right? You, you turn on the news, and more than likely, at some point, you're going to find a, a story about a ruler in some nation around the world, something that's going on, whether they're good or whether they're bad. Uh, and so we also see a lot of movies depicting kings and rulers. Uh, at any given moment, you can probably pick a movie in the movie theater and find something that is depicting a, a, some type of leader in the world, whether it's fictional and made up or whether it's a, an actual biography or something like that that's, that's depicting a historical event. So if I had to ask you this morning, what's your favorite king or favorite ruler of all time? It could be somebody in a movie. Man, I, I just love the, this king out of this movie. Or uh, an actual ruler. That you just were drawn to. I don't know if you all saw recently that they had a kind of a thing on ABC about Princess Diana. And a lot of people are just kind of were just drawn to her, right, because of her personality and, and the things that she did, charitable things she did, even though she was far from perfect. Well, my favorite uh, king or ruler that I, I like to learn about is Alexander the Great. Uh, by the age of 33, this man had um, the largest empire in history. He had conquered so much land that he was leading a group of land, of land and nations from Greece all the way to India. That's, that's a large, if you know your geography, that, some of you may not, but that's a very large uh, group of land, right? Uh, so this was, he's widely recognized as the greatest mili military commander of, of history. And he was never, not once, defeated in battle. That's pretty impressive. Never defeated. And he fought a lot. But as a result of what he did and the conquests he made, he changed the world. All these countries came to know the Greek language and the Greek culture, and it changed the, the whole landscape of the world and how they related and it expanded commerce because people could talk to each other. And that's why we have the, the New Testament that was originally written in the Greek language in Israel because of Alexander the Great. And so I, I really, I'm just captivated by all the things he did. He died at a young age, 
from an illness, but he was a great ruler, a great king, and he, was, he had his faults too, right? No human ruler or king is perfect. But I, I think this interest that we see on the news and uh, in our own minds, there's a reason why they make movies about kings, people watch them. And I think that there's a, just an interest that's put inside of us uh, to, to want to have these great kings and to look up to or to follow their lead, um, and I think that God's put that in us. Uh, because ultimately, the Bible and, and this world is about the ultimate king of the universe. One who is meant to rule over all of us. Uh, one who reigns forever with an eternal kingdom uh, that, that we can follow and that we can get behind and we can cheer and, and support and look up to. And that, that kind of king. And so we're going through the book of John together. And we are seeing Jesus revealed as the Messiah, as the, the Son of God, but we're also going to see him revealed as a king. And today we're going to, as John read earlier, we're, we're going to see two miracles that Jesus does, uh, the feeding of the, the 5,000 men, um, which is recorded in all four Gospels, the only miracle that was refor- recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then he's going to walk on water immediately after this, this feeding. But... Uh, these miracles, as great as they were, uh, there's more to them than just the miracle themselves. And what we're going to see is that the beginning and the end of this passage really shows us um, some important um, themes that we're going to see about Jesus, about who he is, and who he really is, not just the fact that he can do uh, a miracle, like what that means for us today. And what God wants us to see is uh, the vast difference between who uh, we as people want to follow. So we all have kings and rulers that we want to follow, what what that looks like in our mind. But we're going to see the vast difference between who we want to follow, what they can do for us, and what we really need. Uh, The king that we can really uh, get behind because we know we need it in our life. And so to believe in Jesus is to believe in the king that God tells us we need more than anything else in our lives. The one who's going to lead us down the right paths forever. And not just what our desires tell us that we want. And so this passage today is going to make us ask some hard questions about ourselves. Who are we really wanting to follow? Who do we want to lead our life? And why? The king of the universe, Jesus Christ, wants to rule every area of our life. And he is good. He is good. So what Israel wanted, what they really needed, we're going to see that. That we're a lot like Israel. We're a lot like they are. So let's see, let's start in uh, verse 1 of chapter 6, and we're going to see, first of all, the setting. And the setting is really important for us to really understand what God wants us to see in this passage. So let's start in verse 1. After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias, uh, the Roman name for it, and a, hu- and a huge crowd was following him because they saw si- the signs he was performing on the sick. So you can imagine at this time, people are amazed at what Jesus is doing. He's just healed a lame, a lame man in uh, chapter 5. He's changed water to wine. He's done, uh, done other things. And so people want to, to be around him. He's got a huge following. So Jesus, he leaves Jerusalem. And he says he went up on a mountain and sat there with his disciples. And then verse 4. Now the Passover... A Jewish festival was near. So um, we see him out in the country. He's left the, the city of Jerusalem. He's got this following now. And we see that this, this miracle about to happen. But what I want us to really zoom in, in, in on and focus in on is the idea of the Passover. Because this, we, would see, we would think, well, maybe just uh, God threw that in there as an aside to let, let us know track his, uh, his time frame, and we know that this is right in the middle of Jesus' ministry. He, did it, he had the first Passover already, the second Passover he's going to do this, the third Passover is when he's going to be crucified. And so um, the, the, the Passover, just a little background on what that is in case you don't know, Passover is an important Jewish festival. It's, it's a time in the, the nation of Israel where they commemorated God's deliverance of them from Egypt. The Passover was actually the, the final plague where uh, the, the spirit, the angel of the Lord came down, and if any house that had the blood of a lamb on the, on the door that passed over, he spared that family. If they didn't have the blood of the lamb, the firstborn son of that house was killed as a judgment so that, so that God could show the, the Pharaoh of Egypt that he needed to let the Israelites leave, that, that he needed to let them go from slavery. And so the, the, the Israelites were, were you know, just 
very um, much emphasized this festival because it meant freedom for them. It meant rescuing from, from slavery and, and a, a miraculous thing that God had done for them. But it's important um, that it's mentioned here in John 6 for a couple reasons. First, next week we're going to see Jesus kind of expound on this, and he's going to talk about how he is the bread of life. Well, what's that have to do with the Passover? Well, during the Passover, at, at the following seven days after the Passover, the only thing the Jewish people ate was unleavened bread. So for Jesus to say that he's the bread of life meant a lot for them, especially at Passover. And we're going to see that next week. But this week, we're also going to see and recognize, and you need to know that the Passover during Jesus' life was an intense time for nationalistic zeal. Right? So think of the 4th of July here in America. If you've grown up in America, the 4th of July, everybody's waving their flags, they're going to parades, they're singing the, the uh, national songs and hymns. Right? So we get all excited about, or if you're from another country, you know, you, everybody has kind of their, their independence days or their whatever. So we get all excited about these, these national days. Right? And we, we want to get behind it, and we're, we're all about it. And that's what was going on in Israel. But even more so there than we might experience in America. Because they were back kind of in a semi, uh, not slavery, but they were under the rule of another nation at this point. Right? Rome had conquered them and they were servants to Rome. And so while God had delivered them from slavery in Egypt, now they found themselves again under kind of an oppressive rule. And so they're longing for that, that freedom, that, that release where, where God is their king, they can serve him, um, and, and they have a king of their own, and they're prospering. They're longing for that. So their nationalistic zeal is at a high. They are looking for kings. And they're, we know during Jesus' lifetime and shortly after, there were several kind of rebellions against Rome where they were trying to gain freedom. And so you can, you can just imagine the, the environment, the atmosphere. It's, they're ready to fight. Right? They're ready to go. So they are expecting and, and looking for a king who is going to restore their glory. And this king was promised in the Old Testament. So they already have this promise out there. They're just waiting for it to happen. They're just waiting for somebody who looks like a king. They're going to follow him to the end. That's important to note because that's what's on their mind at this time, uh, this week in Jesus' life. So we're going to see why Israel thought this was the king, why they wanted Jesus to be their king. So let's start in verse 5. First thing we're going to see. Uh, Therefore, when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where will we buy bread so these people can eat? So the first thing we see right, right away about Jesus is he's compassionate. Right? He has this huge crowd following, following him, and he's, he's thinking about what they can eat. Like he wants to provide for them. And he, so he turns to Philip, who was from that region, who, who might know where they could go and get some food. And he asks him, where can, where can we get some food? And this is also a test of faith for Philip. Because Jesus knew where he was going to get the food. Right? He wants to see if Philip really trusts him. But in Mark 6, 34 talks about this compassion. It says, this is the same, uh, recounting the same event in Mark's gospel. He says, Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so they were, being, they were wandering, they were trying to... Follow somebody, and Jesus had compassion on them and wanted to fill their needs and, and give them food. And he had a concern for them. And so let's keep in mind here for a minute what's going on here. This is a large crowd. Right? They've seen his miracles. They all want a piece of Jesus. Right? They, they want to get close to this guy. And, and so now he sees there's this overwhelming need of people to feed. And you can imagine that they're, they're probably wearing them down. You've got all these people coming around one guy, unless he's like the most extroverted guy, like my daughter. Uh, for me, big crowds wear me down. <laughs> right? So I, I just don't want uh, to be around crowds all the time. I don't mind it for a little bit. You may think, well, you're a pastor. You should be extroverted. You should like being around people. And I do. I like being around people, but I'm ready. Like, after I leave here, I'll probably go home and lay down on the couch. Because <laughs> you just need a break. And so you can imagine Jesus is probably in that, that same situation. And you might expect Jesus to say, look, we're done here. I'm tired. I need a break. I need to rest. Let's sit down on this mountainside and let's just relax. But I, I need a break from you guys. But that's not what Jesus does. Right? He's compassionate on these people in spite of their pressing need all around him. Um, 
and, and the pressing in, asking them questions left and right. Can you do this for me? Can you heal my sister? Can you help my brother? Can you help my mom? Right? You can just imagine all these people have a lot of needs. But Jesus is still concerned. He's still compassionate for them. And these are likely poor people, so that they had needs probably relating to their finances. We know that, the, as, as we're going to see, that they had barley bread. Barley bread was the bread of the poor people. So these were people in need. But there's no limit to Jesus' compassion and his mercy on them. And wouldn't our world be a better place if every leader had this kind of compassion? Right? Who loved all people, who was not willing to turn away from anybody. And so this, this is what they're wanting. This appeals to them. It's encouraging for us, too. If we say we follow Jesus, we have a God of compassion and mercy. But that, that, that you can see why they would want him to be their king. So that's what we see first, his compassion. Then starting in verse 6, he, look at this miracle he does. He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. So he asked Philip, where can we find food? But he knew what he was going to do already. It's a test. Philip answered, 200 denarii, that's eight months' wages, worth of bread wouldn't, wouldn't be enough for each of them to have even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what, they, what are they for so many? And then Jesus said, have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place. <coughs> Passover time, spring, there's plenty of grass. So they sat down. And the men numbered about 5,000. And then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish, as much as they wanted. So you could you imagine, for a second, being a disciple, with a, seeing this little boy come forward, with this little knapsack or whatever, with five little loaves of bread and two small, probably pickled fish, and seeing then Jesus multiply that to feed 5,000 men up to 20,000 people. That's a lot of people to feed. Right? And so just what we see here is just like in Genesis, Jesus is creating. He's creating out of nothing. And so this miracle, the disciples, the people, would they are seeing the transcendence of Jesus Christ. That he is not an ordinary person. That he is not an ordinary king. Right? This is a witness to his divine nature. It says something of his sovereign power over this world. His power over nature that is invincible. He's creating food. He's creating bread. He has power over atoms and molecules and forces to bring all that together to make bread or fish. It demonstrates the power of Jesus' will in this world. That every particle ultimately bows down before him and moves at his command. Colossians 1.16, Paul, Paul puts it like this. All things are created by him and for him. All things. That's Jesus' power. So you can imagine... Now, people want a king with power to lead them, don't they? I want to follow somebody who's, going to, who's powerful to, to make whatever happen. I don't want to follow a weak ruler. No nation wants a weak king or a weak ruler. Jesus is not weak. We see that right here. He has power. And this miracle shows us, look, the, the will of God, the will of Jesus, is the most powerful force in this world. Right? Nothing can stand up against his will. When he says he wants to do something, it happens. And nobody can stand against it. He's God. The greatest power in this world is not our own ideas to make something happen. Sometimes people say, well, you just think on something hard enough or you just put enough energy or, or something behind it and it'll happen. Right? But that's nothing compared to what God says. And God, God does in his will. It's the will of Jesus before whom one day every knee, people with the greatest power in the world, will bow before him. And will confess that he is Lord. So people saw Jesus' power and they were drawn to him. That's why he has a crowd at this point. This guy has power to act into my life. And we, let's be honest, sometimes we like Jesus because we think he has power to, to help us too. Right? So we're... I'm going to get a little bit closer to him, just in case like he can change this situation and, and help me feel better. Right? So we like Jesus' power. Next, verses 12 through 15. When they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. 
And when the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This really is the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus knew that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So not only did Jesus give them food, verse 11 through 13, he gave them as much as, much as they wanted until they were full, and then there were still 12 baskets left. So he, he does nothing halfway. Right? He, he's not doing it halfway. He's not giving them just a little bit to help them get by for a couple hours. And with 12 baskets, every disciple had a basket for themselves for the next day. So this is a picture of God's abundant grace, his abundant provision in their life. And to care for them, especially those who are following him and want to love him. They're they're following him. He's saying, look, if you follow me, I will provide for you. I will provide. And so the people respond, don't they? They say, this is the prophet that was predicted. Deuteronomy 18, Moses predicted a prophet to come. And they're saying that Jesus is that guy. And they want to make him king right there on the spot, by force. And so we see here his power, his compassion, his provision, these three attributes. Who, want, who wouldn't want a king like that? I mean, it, nobody can blame Israel for wanting to make him king. If anybody could defeat the Romans, who could give them a peace like they had when David was the king, who could provide for them and give them food and help them prosper, it looks like Jesus is the guy. And this is who we need. But the problem was, and these people were all about getting a king to meet their desires. Their desires. And their focus was really on themselves and on their own nation. Because they were thinking about, well, Jesus can do this for us. For us. But the point of the miracle here is not that Jesus is going to meet every physical need for their, for their lives. There's, there's a dangerous line of thinking out there today. It's been there for years, for, for really as long as the world has existed. That passages like this point, point to it and say that well, God's going to give you whatever you want. Whenever you want, all you've got to do is believe in him. And that's a faulty theology. Right? God is not going to give you whatever you want. Right? That's not going to happen. Because he knows what you need. More than what you think you need. But the Bible tells us that Jesus had, him, had, had... I mean, we know this because, look, the, the Bible tells us Jesus had no place to lay his own head. Right? And he was abandoned by his friends and his dying hours. Does this sound like a, a God who's going to give us whatever we want? Like he could have given himself a place to sleep. He could have saved his life, but he didn't. He was ruthlessly murdered for following the Father. And similar fate followed all his disciples. They didn't get everything they wanted. But they didn't know what they needed either. And, and the people of Israel didn't know that they didn't need a king to help them get rid of Rome. That wasn't going to solve their problem. Definitely. They needed a king to rule over their lives on a personal level in the, in the depths of their souls. That's what they needed. To take them from a kingdom of darkness, eternal darkness, to a kingdom of light. And the same is, is true for us. And if we are left to ourselves, we all want people in our lives, we want people that are going to lead our lives, that we think are going to help us get what we want and make our lives better. And so we see Jesus kind of as like this genie in a bottle, right? You rub it, you make a wish, hey, he's going to give that to me. Or you pray it, you make a wish, he's going to give that to me. And I'll say I love Jesus so it, it makes my life better or easier. But when it gets tough, what do we do? We think Jesus is mad at us, right? So we kind of walk away from him and try to figure it out ourselves. And we distance ourselves. Because for some reason Jesus isn't answering my prayers and giving me what I want. And so I'm just going to try something else. And so that, that really shows us our own hearts. Well, how do we respond when we don't get what we want? Uh, in American Christianity, we're, we're the worst at this. Right? We, we have become so consumeristic where everything's about us, even in, even in the church. Like if, if it's not what I like, then I'm going somewhere else. Boom, I'm dropping, I'm dropping these people. <laughs> and so I'm leaving and so when we do that, we're saying, look, Jesus and, and God and the church, they become a means for me to get what I want. And that's the opposite of what Jesus is saying. He came to serve and to sacrifice his life as a ransom for many. And, and so we're saying, no, I can't serve or sacrifice. I'm going to get what I want instead. And so we see how, how we often, we all fall in this trap. We contradict 
what God is calling us to do when we refuse to sacrifice and serve others because it doesn't make us happy or comfortable. What Jesus and the church needs is a church filled with Christians that, that follow him as king even when it's hard. Right? When we love people when they are unlovable. And we serve people even when it may mean that we have to do something we don't like. And that's what, that's what Jesus wants. That's the king he wants to be in our life, to lead us to do those things to do the hard things, because then we really see him work, and he changes our hearts. And I'm convinced, look, if, if this church or any church is going to reach people for the gospel and make an impact on our community, it's going to require this type of mindset. And we're willing to lay down our own desires and to sacrifice for others, put them above us, put others, consider others as more important than ourselves, and serve them. If we want to see God change lives, that's, that's how it happens. They really see a love for others because we're willing to lay down our own desires. And God uses that. And, and ultimately, that's who we are as Christians because Jesus has done that for us. He sacrificed himself, his own desires, to, to save us, to bring us to himself. And so, But so often we are just like the Israelites, aren't we? We, we want what we want. And we miss the kind of king that God wants to be in our life. So are we following Jesus for what he can do for us or what we can do for him because of his great salvation in our life? But Jesus isn't done here. He's not done revealing the truth about his kingship. And so you're going to see a second miracle. So Jesus withdraws from the crowd. He knows, no, they can't make me king, a physical king over Israel, because that's not God's plan. So he disappears. You can imagine just like, Walking away. First of all, can you imagine? Yeah, walking away from a crowd of twenty thousand people wanting to make you king. That, I mean, that just goes against human intuition, right? Most people are like, "All right, let's do this." Right? <laughs> I want to get some power. And Jesus disappears. That's that's how much he valued God's plan for his life over the world, right? The fact that he left. And then, uh, so why why did he do that? It's because he knew they needed a different kind of king. He could have defeated the Romans in a second, right? Just with the, the sound of his voice, they could have all laid down their arms and, and died or gone home. But he had a bigger plan than just defeating a nation. He didn't want to just free people from an earthly enemy, but he wanted to fight against the kingdom of Satan and evil and to set people free from sin and death, not from a nation. That's a big task. That's a bigger task to set all people free from sin and death that's every single person. We all wrestle with that. And so he shows the disciples this. Look at verses 16 through 21. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. Darkness had already set in, but Jesus had not yet come to them. Then a high wind arose, and the sea began to churn. After they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. He was coming near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. And then they were willing to take him on board, and at once the boat was at the shore where they were heading. All right, so at, at this point, imagine the disciples, they've seen all these things. They've seen the people wanting to make him a king. They're probably thinking, well, should we try to make him a king? And is this the king that, that God's sending to us? And they're trying to figure out what kind of king he is. And so then God tests their faith again, which is so often the case, isn't it? When life, we're going through different things in life, we may experience something great. And God wants to test our faith to, to show us, hey, what is our faith really like? Are we just following him because he's doing good things for us? Or are we, are we really trusting him in all situations? So the disciples are in a boat by themselves. The storm comes up, and they are just rowing for their lives. You can imagine these big waves. So I went on a canoe trip yesterday with my dad and my brother, and we canoed about three miles, and it took two hours, and, or a kayak, and it was a, a calm, you know, we're with the current, so two hours. You can imagine rowing for three hours, for three miles, and that's going to take, that's like five or six hours, I'm thinking. They're worn out. They're tired. They're scared. They're just trying to get to shore. And Jesus is, uses this as an opportunity to show them the kind of king he is. So he walks to them on the water. Another miracle in and of itself. But what he says to them is important. 
Because when they see him, they're scared. They're not sure who, who sees somebody walking on water. It's a ghost, right? But he says, no, it is I. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Now, this phrase, it is I, it, the Greek behind it is the same root as I am. If you remember in the Old Testament, God revealed himself to Israel, to Moses, through the phrase, I am. Tell them I am who I am. That's my name. And so this, for the Israelites, this is the identity of who their God is. The God who saved them from Egypt. The God who's rescued them and brought them out of slavery. And so this is a huge phrase. Because all of a sudden, when the disciples hear Jesus say this, they're thinking, wow, God can save our people from Egypt. Jesus can save us from this boat. All right? this, this is our great God. This is our king. And, and I, I can, he, we can trust in him. And that's what we see. Just as Israel was rescued and deliver, delivered from slavery in Egypt, Jesus wanted them to know that he came to rescue them from slavery to sin forever. That's the kind of king he came to be. The king that no power of hell could stand against, that he would free people from their chains to sin. And he would prove it. Right? He proved it as he lived a perfect life. He went to the cross voluntarily to die for our sins as our substitute, and he rose again. He conquered that's a king with power. So that we could know him. So we could know his rescue. We could know his rule in our life. So they thought, the disciples and the Jews thought, hey, we need a king to save our nation. To save our physical lives from hardship. And what Jesus is teaching them, I'm God. There's something much bigger than your nation that I have in mind. I came to establish a kingdom forever, a people redeemed by my blood, set free. And so as we uh, prepare in just a moment for a time of response, I want us to think about what kind of king are you wanting Jesus to be in your life? Are you looking for a Jesus who gives you what you want, what you physically see and you think you want? Have you been kind of giving him an ultimatum, hey, uh, I'll follow you as long as you give me what I want. If, you, if I don't see it, then I'm, I'm going on. And you see that. We see that in our lives, don't we? When things get hard, we, we see what we, how we really feel about Jesus. Do we draw closer to him when things get hard? Or do we feel ourselves drifting from him? That, that gives us an insight in our own hearts. Or are you following a Jesus that uh, who, who we know knows everything that, about what we really need, not just what we want. And so we're, we're trusting him for all things, even when it's tough. But we have to come to Jesus on his terms, not ours. If we only come to him for self-serving ends, just like here in this passage, he still withdraws from us. Right? He's not going to answer our prayers when it's just about our own selfishness. But when we come to him, on his terms, willing to lay it down before him, follow him no matter what, he's there. He, he's welcoming us to do that. Because he knows that we need him more than anything else. And he's worth it. Right? He is worth doing that for. He is the perfect savior. He's the greatest king. He's worth following. And he loves you. He loves you enough to die for you. So ask yourself, are you ruling your life? Where is Jesus? So if you're not a Christian today and you've never made Jesus the king of your life, but he came from heaven to earth to reveal himself, to die for your sins, so that you may know him as your king. And he's calling you to do that today. He's saying, he's saying trust me. Trust that I have forgiven you and follow me the rest of your life. If you're a Christian, <coughs> you thought you followed Jesus, but maybe, maybe you just followed Jesus because you thought it would help your life where you are right now. And you never really wanted him, per se. You just wanted the benefits of him. And maybe you need to confess, man, I thought I was a Christian, but I was following Jesus for the wrong reasons. And maybe he's shown you that today. And if you are a Christian, commit to, to continue to make him king over every area of your life. No matter what you're facing. Trust him, and you will see his power evident in your life. You will see that he is faithful, no matter what. So let's let Jesus be the king over our hearts today. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this insight, this passage that reveals the beauty of who you are.
that you are our great king. That you came to do so much more than to give us uh, a freedom in a nation or a uh, freedom to follow a great ruler. You came to rule our hearts, to change us forever. To show us our great need for you to rule our lives because we mess it up every single time. When we are king of our life, things go badly. Because we all have sin, we all have faulty desires, we all have things that we think we want or think we need that are wrong. We were born this way. But God, we confess to you this morning that you alone know what is right and good for our lives. Because you are God. God, help us to put our trust in you and you alone. Help us to follow Jesus mm -hmm. as our king today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.